My name is Jacqueline Bishop, and I'm a visual contemporary artist in New Orleans. Um, and my work um, explores uh, environmental issues, landscape issues, uh, sometimes um, using materials from the landscape to literally address landscape issues. And how long have you lived in New Orleans? Uh, 40 years. Yes, I finished my education here uh, at the University of New Orleans and got my master's at Tulane and taught at Tulane and then ended up teaching at Loyola University for eight years. I taught a class uh, called Art in the Environment, which uh, I ended up losing with Katrina and then went back for another semester, but it wasn't... Um, uh, the, the, the departments were all changing and it wasn't a part of the art curriculum. It, I was in the um, environmental studies through art and uh, the department that I was in was eliminated. Many universities eliminated many departments in the city. So um, to the extent that you're comfortable, would you talk a little bit about uh, life pre-Katrina, post-Katrina? Uh, Pre-Katrina? Um, do you mean what leading up to it or just what it was like to live here? Or What, it was, what, what was it about New Orleans? You, you're obviously a New Orleanian. You know, oh. You've been here so long. What is it that, you know, you, what would you say describes New Orleans? New Orleans is very much more like the Upper Caribbean. In fact, I think some people would suggest or agree that it is the Upper Caribbean. It has nothing to do with the United States. Um, our culture here is very indigenous, and some people that travel here may not understand what that means uh, uh, through the food or the music, uh, the language, uh, the art, even the visual art. But it is very different. We were kind of like an island from the rest of the country, so we weren't affected as much by art markets, for example, that control art communities. Um, so we maybe had more freedom to express, and there were fewer rules here. Um, it was just a really good place to live and, and make work, make art, and, uh, and to write. I mean, a lot of writers come through here, some stay. Uh, some publish, uh, some just find their soul and then move on. Uh, but And that happens with a lot of visual artists too. Uh, actors, musicians, a lot of them always want to play here in gigs with the local musicians because it's a very indigenous sound, you know, and, it, and um, I always felt that uh, culture comes from the landscape and as the landscape changes, so does the culture. Have you seen changes in the culture post-Katrina? There were significant landscape changes as a result of that. Uh, yeah, it's a completely different city. Really? Yeah. In what ways? There's been an influx of many different types of people from all over the country and other countries um, who have decided to make their work here, their art, write music, write books, uh, open up galleries. Um, it's a more uh, diverse, in some ways, um, art community and much, much larger. I mean, thousands of them have moved here, have relocated. So, and they're usually in their 20s and 30s, but the older uh, new people that have moved here are really quite interesting. And a lot of them add a whole different, um, different view, a different world view to the world view that we had, or the New Orleans view that we had. Uh, but as far as the changing landscape, uh, the Ninth Ward, which was kind of uh, misunderstood, uh, ignored, or most were unaware of, is now home to a lot of these new people. And, and then some of the locals that chose to relocate there and rebuild uh, in some of the abandoned homes. So there are art galleries. There's like 15 or 18 art galleries. Um, there are health food stores, yoga 
uh, studios. Um, there are uh, some in some of the abandoned lots, there are now organic farms. So we have huge amount of urban farming going on. So we don't rely on the bigger farms in the North Shore or outside the city. I mean, they're right in the city and we're eating really good food, fresh food. <laughs> and I think it has changed um, menus and restaurants. Uh, a lot of new people have moved here and opened restaurants and brought what they knew uh, wherever it was. Some uh, chef from uh, Maryland, another from South Carolina, and they all have their own uh, secrets and they are uh, adding them to the gumbo pot, as they say. So um, are there things that, how would you describe this? Is this a natural evolution for New Orleans? Is this, um, is the difference significant or is it similar to what's always happened just with some different nuances? No, this is much different because it's much more dramatic. And it's, there's so many people that have relocated here. We've had hurricanes before in the past and uh, the devastations uh, have been regional or you know, in certain areas, but this uh, covered, uh, you know, I mean, 82% of the city was underwater. We had uh, a little under 500,000 in the population and we lost half that. And so that, that changed everything. And then the influx of different people who were not here before, who maybe didn't understand the culture, you know, they didn't know what a second line was or something like that. Um, or they would not understand uh, some of the old indigenous recipes, like the older restaurants, the more formal restaurants, like Antoine's, Arnaud's, Galatois. Well, th those are all old Creole recipes, you know, like 150, 50 years old, and a lot of people didn't understand uh, those because it wasn't um, American um, contemporary cuisine or something, you know. So uh, everything changed with Katrina because of the uh, losses were larger. And they had, I guess, had to be replaced with something. So yeah, I mean, it, it evolved into something um, um, very different. Where do you see yourself in New Orleans now? What are your hopes, aspirations? What's the next steps for you? What are the next steps for you? Well, I, I, uh, I'm not teaching anymore, and I did a little radio work uh, on the NPR affiliate station, WWNO. I had a program where I interviewed artists called Louisiana Artists. I did that for five years. But after Katrina, I don't teach anymore. I don't sit on boards. I don't do the radio. I'm just painting full time because I realize that time's running out. And I just want to be in the studio producing. I'm only as good as my last painting. So it has to be, um, it's more about the work. Um, I'm probably a little more territorial about New Orleans now. Uh, I was before, but now I realize, uh, you know, I almost had to leave. Everybody else was gone and some still haven't come back. And then when the changes came with the economy and the universities and the hospitals and the businesses, so many people lost their jobs. I lost so many professor friends. Um, they're all over the United States uh, teaching in other universities because uh, they were forced to leave or they wanted to leave. They didn't want to deal with any more complications. And so it's a very different place for me. You know, there's a lot of new people here, but a lot of the ones that I grew up with are gone. So it's kind of a different place. So the comment, I'm only as good as my last painting. Tell us something about your artwork. <laughs> I mean, I've seen some of it, but uh, for, and, and I'm going to uh -huh. try and get some of these images, but yeah. You know, the, the field guide installation is but one of the many things I've seen. Yeah. Like NOLA has um, one of your images online, several of your images online, actually. The yeah. K-N-O-W law uh -huh. <laughs> as the yeah. New Orleans Encyclopedia. So tell, oh, yeah. us, uh -huh. tell us something about um, what are you working on right now? Well, I just finished uh, my next exhibition, which will open at Arthur Roger Gallery 
in November 7th. And the title of that show is The Other Landscape, with the whole idea of uh, uh, the landscape that we inhabit, we do not see. And that's The Other Landscape. And I've done uh, a, a large body of paintings. I'm a painter. And then I did a large uh, body of watercolors, large scale. Um, I collect river water from the Mississippi, mix it with my watercolors. And then I collect um, newsprint from the different third world countries that I've been traveling for 20 years or more. Uh, mostly Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, India, Bangladesh. and I. Uh, use these these uh, newsprint uh, that were made from trees and uh, from the water in that region in that country and the chemicals in it and so I make collage out of the newsprint and then I do uh, watercolors out of the Mississippi River water uh, over the collages so I'm literally um, using landscape materials to address landscape issues and um, so that will be included in the exhibition, The Other Landscape. I look forward to seeing some of that. Now that's going to be up where? Arthur Roger Gallery. And where is that? That is in the Arts District on Julia Street in the Warehouse District, mm -hmm. Gallery Row. Many names for it. <laughs> <laughs> and you were also telling me in your email that you were um, you're giving a lecture in Kansas? at uh, the Mariana Kistler Beach Museum of Art at Kansas State University has been very quietly collecting my work over the years and so they offered me a solo exhibition with just their collection, their permanent collection and uh, it opened in August. I haven't seen the show and they're bringing me in December to give a talk and I will give a talk titled Climate Strange. So one of the thing, two of the things I try to do is give people who are interviewing with us the opportunity to say if there's something you want to say about New Orleans, about yourself, that you think people might not get or might not have gotten. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if there's something you want to say, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. So this is the first part of that. Well, I would like to tell the whole world that New Orleans is no longer underwater. Is there more? No. That's it? All righty. Um, and then the second part of that is I try to give um, Forrest and Pippa and Katie the opportunity to ask questions too because a lot of times they pick up on stuff that is really interesting. Do you guys have questions? Is that the sign? Straight to me. <laughs> I always go straight to Katie. <laughs> well, I was wondering um, how it was like to sort of back to a place that you had called home for such a long time and to see it so different and put that into art, into your art and building and rebuilding the community. You mean come back after Katrina or come back, back to Milne Boys Home? Uh, well, my husband and I stayed for three days. We stayed through the storm. Yes, and uh, our neighborhood didn't have any water, but we had other issues. And um, I documented the sounds with a tape recorder through the storm. I just turned the tape recorder on and listened, you know, to all of the, the trees falling and the glass breaking and it was very eerie. The wind was high. There was a tornado also in the neighborhood. And we had damage, wind damage, and uh, it was not a pretty sight. And so we waited for the about approximate 12 hours for it to get over with. and. And we stayed in the living room and the wind goes in one direction, you know, the first six hours, and then it goes in the opposite direction, counterclockwise, the second six hours or so, and that is when it's heavier, when it's stronger. And um, it was very loud and dramatic and frightening. And we never leave for hurricanes. And it was the last part of that evening, that night, I realized that I thought we made a mistake and I didn't know if we were going to make it. And then it was over. 
and I opened the door and I looked out and it looked like a wasteland. I mean, there were trees everywhere, so we walked uh, for blocks and blocks and there were a few people out. And then my husband went back and so I started walking around and I saw some of, uh, a few of my neighbors that stayed because I had no idea who stayed. And then I saw um, one of our neighbors who I didn't know who was dead lying on the corner of uh, Jackson and Magazine and I froze. I didn't know what happened and I can't remember. I was, I had a camera. I didn't have a cell phone at that time. Um, I didn't have digital. That's what it was. Katrina made me go into digital and uh, so I think I took pictures but I haven't looked at any of my pictures since Katrina. So um, I didn't know what happened to her, and I couldn't see this part of her, but her, she was lying on the corner, and there was a group of people trying to figure out what they should do, and so I think there was a doctor in the neighborhood who decided to bury her, and he buried her, and a couple weeks later, the coroner came by and, and dug her up to, have, to give her a proper funeral. But, you know, there was no power. There was no computers. There was nothing, and uh, we didn't know that the levees broke until Tuesday late afternoon. And we were not going to leave because I'm a camper and we were prepared for two weeks with water and food. I had a gas stove. We had a landline. But I was getting calls from my friends in Brazil and Israel and Bangladesh and everyone saying, I have to leave, I have to leave. And we said, no, no, we're fine. And they said, you don't understand what's happening. The levees broke. And then we, we thought maybe they don't know what they were talking about. We didn't have CNN. So we went on the streets and I ran into some friends of mine. And they said, yes, the levees broke. Uh, we, we got a TV, and my house is in Lakeview, and I saw the top of my house completely underwater. And she says, and it's coming this way, and the water's moving this way. Well, it, I think it went like eight blocks from us. And uh, so we uh, couldn't get out anyway. There was no way out. Every entry was flooded. And so we waited and, and, until Wednesday, and that's when uh, we heard the police were looting Walmart, we knew it was time to go. And uh, so we, were only, we went to, we, we didn't know how we were going to get out, and there were um, gangs forming, and we didn't know if we were going to be able to get out because they wouldn't let us through. And then, uh, but you know, these were, we were all frightened, everyone. and. They, they were angry, we were frightened uh, and confused and, and angry that we didn't know what was going on. Um, there were, I never saw a policeman anywhere. And um, we finally packed our car, brought 12 birds with us <laughs> and put them in their cages and kind of put the different species together in one cage, which didn't go over too well. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we left, and <clears throat> when we uh, got to the Mississippi River Bridge, uh, Crescent City Connection, and there was no one around. We were the only ones around, nothing. And we got over the bridge, and there were no signs and there were truck drivers doing this, trying to you know, get not, you know, ask us where they were because <clears throat> they were on, en route to, a, to go somewhere, to be somewhere, and they had no idea where they were because all the signs were ripped away and blown away. And it was complete chaos. And we made it to Houston to stay with my sister for a while where she uh, got me a gig teaching an art project at a little elementary school for their art auction, a fundraiser for the school, and they ended up having record amount for that, so I'm, I was glad that I was able to help because I was a wreck. I didn't realize that I was traumatized, and uh, but I don't think anybody realizes that for like a year or so. And then um, uh, I had an invitation to go to Mobile to work and curate a show on New Orleans artists. 
but I didn't know where any of them were. And they gave me eight to 10 days to come up with this show because of their funding, because the other curator from New Orleans was stuck in Boston and decided he didn't want to have any part of it. And he, he, he was, you know, traumatized like all of us. And so I didn't have a computer, so we snuck into New Orleans and we lied, uh, had a fake pass to get a computer. And then, um, uh, and then we didn't stay long. Uh, we, we were back on September 24th, but I was uh, able to get like 39 or 40 artists for that show. And they all came, almost all of them came to the opening in Mobile. And it was about 850 people there at the opening. And it was the first time anybody had seen each other. So it was extremely emotional. And it traveled to three other places and had a catalog. Um, I'll get you the catalog if you're interested. Because there's only hardly any, any left, but this is a good project. To, okay. And, um, and, you know, a few of the artists have died since then. Um, so it's, it was never meant to be a tightly curated exhibition of new work by these artists. The whole concept was, and it was, I titled it Made in New Orleans, a survey of contemporary art in New Orleans. And it was, uh, it was only to present the artwork that was made before Katrina because no one was going to be the same. And no one was going to make the same kind of work. And everyone was going to be different people, different artists if they even came back. And so it was, uh, that was the last show of its kind. You know, that was sort of like the watermark that was all over. So um, it, was, it was very difficult. I worked on it for 10 hour days. I didn't sleep. Uh, I lost a lot of weight. And I, I wasn't, uh, I was just uh, mostly drinking wine and uh, eating. I ate, I ate all right, we were guests. Uh, invited and we were house guests at a very very nice family who helped us and um, but it was uh, I think that liquor store owners became multi-millionaires is there a lot of um, art that's changed you think I mean you just alluded to that you guys would never do the same kind of artwork um, do you see that? Oh, yes. Uh, I think materials have changed with people. I think, um, first of all, people are more aware and sensitive to environmental issues than they were not before mm -hmm. Katrina. There were just a few of us working with the environment, and I had been doing that for 30 years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, or more. I, I don't know. It seems like my whole life. But uh, now there's a lot of people who are focusing more on uh, social injustice and environmental injustice issues. And it had to happen. I mean, they needed, it needed to be addressed. This city was filled with those types of injustices on every level. And now with videographers and painters and sculptors and, uh, and everybody is, you know, doing their own research and investigations and uh, exposing. You know, and it had to be done. I mean, art isn't just about making beautiful, pretty things. It's about having something to say and dealing with humanity. Otherwise, it's decoration. Other questions? Anyone? That's a good one, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> I actually do have one more about the arts. Do you think that, like, the change has happened? Is it something that you would consider a positive You mean the post-K change in the culture? Yeah, and, and how that's affected the art that's occurred from it. Well, there's a lot of uh, more international art being made. Um, I went to a gathering, a huge gathering at Arthur Roger Gallery right after the storm, and there was a panel, and Dan Cameron was on the panel. And <laughs> I think it was that night that 
he came up with the idea of having a biennial here, you know, because he's a, uh, very active in the international biennial world. And he came up with the idea of having an international biennial here um, and getting attention, uh, creating awareness about New Orleans uh, in post-K and in many ways uh, different parts of New Orleans would have been ignored if it weren't for that biennial, which did happen, Prospect One. And it confu I said uh, I was a moderator for a panel that he was on with several other people. Um, and it, it was, uh, I think the topic was art galleries, art fairs, and biennials. And so I had each panelist against their will define what each one of those was because we had about 200 people in the audience and uh, this was New Orleans. And most of them had never been to a biennial or an art fair and they thought they knew what an art gallery was supposed to be. And so they, against their will, defined, which you know, started the ball rolling and helped a great deal. And, um, but a lot of locals, uh, a lot of New Orleanians, were confused by an international biennial here. Uh, they thought that that was gonna be about them. If he was doing this for New Orleans, it was gonna be about them as artists. They were gonna be in the show. And that wasn't his idea at all. And so I asked uh, some tough questions uh, that sort of put him on the defensive, but I wanted him to defend himself and to speak for himself of what he wanted because everybody was asking me, you know, what is it that he, he's doing? And I wanted him to, to say this, and he, and he did it all right. But, the, so, but I had to simplify it, and the bottom line for the biennial, uh, International Biennial in New Orleans was that it was a show that Dan happened to set in New Orleans, but is not about New Orleans. It wasn't going to be any New Orleans artist in it, any Louisiana artist. And as it turned out, I think there were like a couple of Louisiana artists in Prospect One, and then a little bit more as it went on. But um, that kind of inspired artists to stay. Uh, some of the artists, in the international artists, came with their assistants to install their exhibitions and the assistants never left. So that was the beginning of the evolving uh, art community. Uh, and then they would get their friends to come and then pretty soon, you know, we were getting written up nationally, internationally, and a lot of different people decided to come and check it out and then not leaving. And it's just been growing ever since. And so that's the art part of it. And it's happened in the, in the food world as well. Now, along with like a lot of the, it sounds like you've been pretty happy with a lot of the changes. Is there things that you don't necessarily like how, how, things, how, how things have changed since? I, I'm concerned like a lot of New Orleanians are about gentrification um, in the Ninth Ward and I realize that a lot of houses are still abandoned in the Lower Ninth. And, um, and a lot of uh, new businesses are opening uh, that some of those people that did come back and rebuild, they can't afford to eat in those restaurants or they're not going to go in a yoga studio or they're not going to go into, you know, d uh, buy some of the uh, expensive organic food or something like that. So there, and you know, that whole Ninth Ward area, I mean, not just that area, but a lot of really good musicians came out of that area. And, um, and if they can't afford to live in their neighborhoods where generations of them um, grew up and created culture and they can't afford to live there anymore, that's uh, going to change everything. And so that's how the landscape, in my view, changes culture because of um, changing uh, businesses and, you know, that whole landscape is changing uh, in that way. And there, a lot of them are younger who have the energy to, uh, to rebuild and to live on less 
and to have less demands and to make it work. You know, they've got the stamina. So, um, but then on the other hand, the rents are going up in uh, the bywater. The rents are going up all over the city. Uh, a lot of locals can't afford the rents. Um, my two sons, who are born and raised here, uh, are having a hard time finding places to live. And uh, they're not crazy with the changes. And so I, so I think the Katrina era children are probably less happy with it than everybody else in some ways. So, uh, you know, they're seeing their city change and all of the uh, old places that they used to hang out are uh, sold to other people from Florida or New York. Or, um, and then the Airbnbs that are taking over and owned by, I know uh, of instances just this week talking to people in my friends' neighborhoods, uh, New York, California, Florida, Ohio. A lot of people have come down and just bought up a lot of homes that they find they're in shock at how inexpensive the real estate is and so they're buying them in multiples and um, renovating them uh, by maybe leaving the facade on and then taking out all the other local character and then renovating it and then uh, using them for Airbnb. So, Neighborhoods, I mean, New Orleans, as you know, is made up of hundreds and hundreds of neighborhoods, you know, with little bars and little groceries or whatever. And uh, everybody knows each other, and now a lot of people don't know who their neighbors are because they're temporary in an Airbnb. And the rents are going up, and so that changes things. You know, that's, I'm really worried about the flavor of, of what New Orleans uh, what, what makes it unique, you know, and that goes even with the architecture. I mean, there's certain neighborhoods that have strict zoning laws, thank God, but um, there seem to be some ways that people are getting around some of it more and more, and it's really sad.